Jean Yarden, I would like to thank you for taking out the time to join us on the Bible in the News. Yarden, Yarden Frankel is uh, with Honest Reporting. Their website is www.honestreporting.com. So, Yarden, could you explain to our listeners what Honest Reporting does, what it's all about? Sure. We monitor the media, all the mainstream media, and as much as the Internet as we can, for stories about the Middle East, in particular stories about Israel. And what we try to do is go through and see if these stories are accurate and if the reporting is objective and professional, or if there is some sort of bias against Israel in that reporting. Because what we have found, uh, and what a lot of people looking at the news have found, is many people in the mainstream media have a bias against Israel. And when something happens out here, the first reaction and the way it's reported is that Israel's to blame. Israel's the aggressor, and the Palestinians are the victims. And uh, that's how they report the news. So our job really is to see what's going on and report uh, on the Internet and to our 180,000 uh, followers uh, what the media is doing. And when we find a case of clear bias, we ask people to write to the media and say, you know, why aren't you being more objective? How can you be reporting things that are biased against Israel? Okay. So how did honest reporting begin? Was there a particular event that gave impetus to start the organization? Well, about seven or eight years ago during the Intifada, there was a picture that ran in the New York Times. And the picture was of a young man with blood all over his face. And behind him, there was an Israeli in uniform wielding a club. The caption on that picture said that this was a picture of a Palestinian man being beaten by Israeli police. Now, it turns out that picture was, uh, that's very far from the truth. The picture was of a young uh, Jewish uh, student who was caught by a Palestinian mob, beaten within inches of his life, and rescued by an Israeli policeman. And the policeman wielding the club was shielding that man from being killed by a mob. Now, this was certainly not the first case of anti-Israel bias or something making in the, in the news that was anti-Israel, but it really was a catalyst for people all around the world who were fed up and said, we can't keep having this. Uh, that, that picture, by the way, it went around the world, and even today you'll find it on some anti-Israel websites has evidence about the Israeli tactics against uh, Palestinian civilians. So all the time a, a hurt Israeli uh, boy, teenager, was being portrayed as a hurt Palestinian? As a Palestinian, right. And yeah. uh, In fact, it was the boy's father who wrote to the New York Times saying, that's my son, that's not a Palestinian man. And beyond that... If there was anybody there who was awake and looking at photos as they came in with captions, you can see a picture of a gas station behind uh, the policeman and the person being beaten. And the photo said this was on the Temple Mount. There are no gas stations on the Temple Mount. So obviously this was a case of very sloppy journalism. It wasn't the first time, and it certainly wasn't the last. Right. Okay, now if I was to t tell somebody that an established news outlet, um, which has enjoyed a good reputation for many years, such as the BBC, was biased in their reporting, they would no doubt be skeptical. How would you prove to them, for instance, say the BBC, that they are biased in their reporting against Israel? Well, if it was somebody who followed the baby BBC regularly, uh, I don't think they'd be that surprised. Uh, this question has come up not just by us. Uh, right now there is a lawsuit. The BBC took it upon itself to do an internal investigation to determine whether their reporting in the Middle East was biased. And the report was finalized and given to the BBC, and the BBC said, we're not going to let this report become public. And now there are several lawsuits against the BBC saying you have to make this report public. It's a freedom of information request under British law. And uh, so far the courts are siding with those who say make this report public. So we are not the first to challenge the BBC. We have written, uh, right now we've written three long-term analysis of the BBC trying to describe their reporting on Israel. We, the last one is going to come out in a couple of days where we look at things like the Gaza conflict. In the Gaza conflict, the BBC, on more than one occasion, on many, many occasions, wrote articles that broke all laws of journalism. They were articles based on accusations with no other evidence. There was one headline article about Israeli soldiers machine-gunning Palestinian civilians 
uh, women coming out of a house with their hands up and being shot in the head. And there's no evidence about this. This is simply some Palestinian called the BBC and said, this is what happens. There's no names, there's no bodies, there, there's absolutely nothing to this. And uh, there's, there's so many of these articles that happen just in the Gaza conflict. You have to scratch your head and saying, well, why are they always depending on these Palestinians with, with no other evidence? Why would they print something with no evidence? Right. Um, could you explain what happened in Jerusalem recently with the, uh, the digger sure. attack? Sure. And... What, what, what happened in Jerusalem is we saw, once again, a terror attack using a construction vehicle. This is the third time in a year that a Palestinian on a construction vehicle has attempted to kill and injure Israeli civilians. Uh, this is by any definition a terror attack. And the BBC, for each one of these attacks, their headline, their initial headline, and sometimes they've kept this up for hours and hours, is things like bulldozer driver shot dead. In other words, whatever's happened in the Middle East, Israel must be to blame for something. Uh, there must be a Palestinian victim. Instead of, most people reported, Palestinian terror attack in Jerusalem. Uh, bulldozer driver on terror rampage. Th those are correct headlines that tell the reader or the viewer what the news is. Uh, that's the job of the media, not to put their own opinion in there. And this is not my opinion. I ask anybody out there, whatever their feelings in Israel, what best des describes a Palestinian driver on a bulldozer trying to kill people who was finally shot by a Israeli policeman. What headline best describes that? Bulldozer driver shot dead? or Palestinian terror rampage. Yeah, so what they're doing is they're, they're making it sound like Israel shot some that just, you know, was going around shooting people. Right, a Palestinian driver. On some of our reports, we've gone and looked at headlines, and what we found is unbelievably, the percentages are huge. Anytime there's an uh, Israeli attack on Palestinians, the headline is, Israeli army shoots four, Israelis kill five, uh, Israeli helicopter fires rockets. But when there's a Palestinian attack, we see the headlines are things like Israeli injured by rockets, uh, rocket attack on Starot, uh, Starot hit by rockets. And they, they keep leaving out, well, who's firing the rockets? Uh, now, we're not there to give them a style sheet and tell them how they should be reporting, but we do say you should be consistent. Why is there a difference in how you report depending on who did the attacking? Right, which was actually, that actually brings me into my next question, which was the rocket attacks from Gaza. Um, so how would you describe those? How has the reporting been on those attacks? Well, it was, uh, it was almost non-existent when the rocket started. Uh, if you recall, several years ago, Israel withdrew... Uh, settlers from Gaza, Israeli soldiers from Gaza, we withdrew all our presence from Gaza. And in answer to this, and this is what the world and the Palestinians have been asking for for years and years, please give us land, give us land, we withdrew. And the next day we started having rockets fired at Starot. Not at some Israeli settlement out there, not that they should be able to do that, and I say that as somebody who lives on an Israeli settlement. I'll. I'll be very clear and direct about that. But they started firing these rockets at Starot in response to us leaving the Gaza Strip. And at first, the reporting was almost not there. They said, well, not enough people are dying. And that's kind of odd because it is a news story. I can tell you I've been to Starot many times, and you have children who are growing up all their years. They can't play outside. It's, uh, it's very depressing. I, I just read an article today that they just... Uh, finished, they inaugurated a uh, playground, an indoor playground for the children of Starot that has concrete overhead that's rocket proof, which is a wonderful thing for the children there, but it's a very, it's a very sad news item that children have to uh, play inside bomb shelters. And when we see reporting about the rockets, a lot of times we have words like homemade, crude, uh, belittling these rockets. I tell you, if you live in Starot, and every night you and your family drag the mattresses into the basement, into the bomb shelter, there's something happening there that you can't just dismiss the way the BBC and others in the media do. And uh, because they underreported it for so many years, that's why the story out of Gaza conflict was disproportionate. Why is Israel attacking? Why are they 
killing so many people? Why are they using helicopters and artillery and everything? Because we, Israel, have been the subject of attack for years and years and years. So the media can be biased just by not reporting it or, or by... what they Absolutely, what they choose to report and how they report it, that can be very opinionated and that can indicate bias. And calling these rockets homemade, they are, they homemade. are very deadly. Yeah, could you make a Qassam rocket in your house? I can't make one in my house. I mean, homemade, uh, you have a bake sale with things that are homemade, right? Yeah. You put together a uh, Pinewood Derby car, and that's homemade. You, don't, you can't make a rocket in a house. These are supplied by Iran. These are, uh, some of them are more sophisticated. Yes, we shouldn't be blamed that their targeting systems aren't the best. But then again, these are weapons of terror. They are not interested in trying to target a military base. They just wanted to hit Starot. They wanted to hit uh, any Israeli town down there on the border. Right, because they're just trying to hit civilians, accuracy isn't a big deal for them. They're weapons of terror. You can Believe me, you, you can be terrified if a rocket hits you, hits the house next to you, or hits the house down the block. Yeah. Okay, Honest Reporting is affiliated with... Uh teachkidspeace.org, is that correct? Well, Teach Kids Peace was a project we started uh, a few years ago to try to get a different, it's not exactly media bias, we want to get a different message out, and that message is we want the world to see what is the education system of the Palestinians. Uh, it, it's incredible. On their television, in their schools, they are not educated toward peace. They are educated towards war. They have schools named after suicide bombers. I, I mean, just think about that. The school is named after a terrorist. Those are their role models. Well, how can we ever have peace when you have a generation of Palestinians being raised to hate Israelis? I, the other day, uh, a few months ago, there was a parent-teacher conference at one of my kids' schools, and I went over there, and I was waiting to speak to the teacher, and I was in the library, and I saw an English book there, and I decided to leaf through the book, and I, I found this section on Islam. It was about comparative religions, and the section on Islam, I just read this note about Ramadan is this month where you fast and have to think about others, and, and all this very nice and sweet things over there. If you went, as we have, if you look at Palestinian textbooks and the way they they describe Judaism, and some of them Christianity also, I have to tell you, it is uh, only in the most hateful terms. And basically, if you kill a non-Muslim, that is a great thing. And that's the education that their, uh, their schools provide, and much of their education is paid for by United Nations dollars, actually. Now, okay, so recently there's been a lot of appeals going around f for money for Gaza, and in particular relating to what you've just been saying, organizations mm -hmm. donating money to the children of Gaza. How do you think that money could end up being used? Well, it's, uh, I, I also write a column uh, here on the Internet, crossingtheardain.com, and my last uh, article I started with saying about how many people around the world want to rebuild IDF targets in Gaza which is a tongue-in-cheek way of saying all this money is being poured in, believe me, uh, we're going to have to go to war again because the rockets have not stopped for a day. And so all these people who want to feel good and throw their money at Gaza, you're throwing it away because Gaza is controlled by Hamas, which is a terrorist organization. And if you think that anybody's going to say, oh, no, Hamas won't get their hands on this, you're absolutely wrong. Hamas controls everything that occurs in Gaza. Okay, so if I send some money, you know, to the children of Gaza, it's probably still going to end up being controlled by Hamas. You're going to send it to the terrorists of Gaza. Right. In, uh, in Psalm 122, it says, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. Today, most of the world doesn't love the things of Zion or the Jewish people. Do you think anti-Semitism could be at the root cause of some of this in the media bias? Well, there's different types of media bias, and certainly a one big factor is anti-Semitism. There is this notion that Israel is this great Goliath and the Palestinians are this worthy, noble victim out there, and it, it's not in touch with reality at all. Uh, other bias is simply because uh, news happens very fast, and in today's age, we have the Internet. Every news organization out there has to get a story up within seconds. And the Palestinians have an amazing propaganda machine. Something explodes, and they're there to tell the media exactly what happened, even if they're lying through their teeth. 
We had, within minutes of an explosion near a United Nations school in Gaza, we had these headlines all over the world. Israel shells UN school, kills 40, 41, 42 people. And it was only a couple days later, after all the investigations, that we find out, no, Israel didn't shell a school. There were Hamas terrorists firing rockets from right outside the school. Israel responded and killed 12 people. Nine of them were Hamas terrorists. That's the story there. But already Israel has lost because the story was out. No one remembers what I just told you. What they remember is, oh, yeah, didn't Israel blow up a school? And that's what Hamas wants. That's what they want for propaganda. While we build schools with reinforced concrete roofs, they fire rockets from their schools hoping that we will return fire and there will be dead Palestinian children that they can run to the media with. And it's a tragedy for Israeli children and for Palestinian children. And the fact that Israel has to build schools with concrete reinforced roofs to protect against rockets maybe doesn't even get reported in the media. Yeah, let me ask you, what if on the southern border of the United States, uh, from Mexico, the Mexicans were shooting rockets at uh, Texas schools every day, so much so that the people of Texas had to start putting concrete roofs over all the playgrounds for the children? That's an absurd situation. I don't think any American would stand for that. No, certainly not. Okay, Yarden, I would like to thank you again for joining right. us on the Bible in the News. And, uh, okay, your, your listeners can keep up with things by going to www.honestreporting.com. Okay, thank you. Thanks again. All right, thanks a lot. Join us again next week, God willing, at www.bibleinthenews.com for a refreshing perspective on world events. This has been David Billington with you.